again, thank y'all so much for, for praying through this week. Um, it is a blessing to be back here together with you this morning. We're going to be in Jeremiah 29. This is probably the most spoken of passage in Jeremiah, especially uh, verse 11. Um, and it's a very familiar verse, um, especially if you've had a high school graduate or a college graduate or you when you graduated high school or, or college. This verse continues, Jeremiah 29, 11, seems to pop up at those times because it points to a God who... Um, who has a plan for his people. And so we're going to walk through this passage together. I do have a question, though, to start with. This was a question that was in your study guide. And I'm curious. Has anybody here in your life ever had a pen pal, an actual real pen pal? You had never met the person, but you started, whether through school or somewhere else, you started writing letters back and forth. Has that happened to anybody? I did. I did. Too. <laughs> Yeah. Tell us about that real quick. Tell us about your pen pal. Um, well, when we were, I was, when, well, during the Vietnam War, there would be, um, in the, in the um, summertime, I would go visit my aunt down in South Carolina, Greenwood, yeah. and there would be convoys coming through the town, and they would throw out pieces of paper, and it would be their address, and so I got a pen pal that went to war. And um, my sister, she even got one of them. Um, she got a bracelet with his name on it, and she wore it forever and ever. She probably still has it. How about but that? It's just encouragement sent back and forth, you know, for the yeah. family. Did you ever meet your pen pal personally? Um, no, I didn't. His name was Ray Rachecki, and he was from California. How about I that? Never, no, I'll never forget his name. But he would write you letters, and you'd write him letters. Exactly. That's yeah. great. I was Thank in junior high school. Someone else, I think, said they had a pen pal. Who was that? I did in in elementary school. Yeah. There was not too much contra. Uh, I didn't get too many letters, but he was. It was a boy in England. Oh that's, my goodness! That's really all I remember. And I, I saved a letter I got from him. I, I may, it may still be in some of my junk drawers. <laughs> <laughs> now, did your school your school set that connection up? Yeah, it was. I, I don't even remember, the, you know, which class, but it was sometime mm -hmm. in elementary school. Yeah. How about that? That's neat. That's neat. Well, that's that. That was definitely in the days before um, social media and, and ways to connect with people in a similar way. But there's just something. Um, I guess more more meaningful when it's a handwritten note. And even if you've never met the person, you can express some words of encouragement. Well, and today we're going to look at Jeremiah. And he's actually, the words here he's writing um, are encouraging to some, but to others that he's writing, um, they're not words of encouragement. There, there is a message from the Lord uh, regarding personal judgment. And so Jeremiah 29 really is just a collection of messages, a collection of letters to people and it's not really pen pals <laughs> but there is a there is an aspect of that that they're writing letters back and forth and even though um jeremiah when he's writing these messages he's in jerusalem and but many of the the people of judah have already been taken captive and taken to exile in babylon and that's who jeremiah is writing to writing these letters to to the exiles that are already there um zedekiah is the king and um, Jehoiakim was the king right before Zedekiah, and he's already been taken captive, um, and he's in Babylon as well as, as an exile um, there in, in Babylon. So with, with that said, let's just jump right on here to verse 1 through 3 of Jeremiah. Let's see what he begins to write here, what, what the word tells us, these messages. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles. And to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken from exile or taken into exile from Jerusalem into Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah. It's also Jeconiah is also um, another name for Jehoiakim. So that's the same king. This was after the king Jeconiah the, and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. There's a whole bunch of folks who had been taken into exile. I don't know if you remember, but Jehoiakim, he only reigned for three months 
before he was taken into exile. And then um, Zedekiah was the next king, and he was really a puppet king. Um, <laughs> you know, the, he, he did the, at the beck and call of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, verse 3 says, the letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and, and Gamaria, Gamaria, yeah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So there was no email in those days, but they did have envoys that would travel back and forth between Jerusalem and Babylon, and they would, they would communicate that way. They would send letters, and those letters would be uh, read publicly, if that was the, the avenue for that. Um, imagine you know, you're, you're off in another place and, and Richard Griffin decides to write you a letter and he would write you a letter and it may be to the governor of the place that you're at, but it may be for everybody. So that letter would be read publicly. And so Richard, thank you for uh, writing that letter because we really want to hear from you if that's the situation, okay? <laughs> um, by the time Jeremiah's writing this, Jerusalem had actually been um, raided twice. There were already two waves of people that had been carried off uh, to Babylon. And so the clock for the 70 years of exile, the clock had already started. Even though there was going to be more people who had been, would be deported, the clock of 70 years had already begun. And um, so by the time we see the, the end of this 70 years, um, it actually had started before Jeremiah 29 was, um, had been written. Um, interesting. Let me step to the side here and give you a little sidebar. This is interesting as I was studying um, Jehoiakim is listed, King Jehoiakim, or, and, or um, Jeconiah is also is the name. He's listed in Matthew chapter 1. When you read the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, Jehoiakim is mentioned, which is inter interesting. Because there's a, there was a curse that was placed on Jehoiakim because of his unfaithfulness, that none of his descendants would, would be on the throne. Well, we know that Jesus sits on the throne of David. That's the, that's the great king, the king of kings. But here's Jehoiakim, who there was a curse that none of his descendants would sit on the throne. And so when you read that, you think, well, why is he mentioned in the genealogy? I mean, we know Jesus is the king, and he came through the lineage. Why is Jehoiakim mentioned? Wasn't there a curse? Does anybody happen to know, have thoughts on that or know the answer to that? I wouldn't expect you to. Um, that was going to be bonus points if you did. But it's really interesting because in Matthew, the lineage that you see, the genealogy that you see in Matthew, is the genealogy of Joseph. Not Mary, but of Joseph. The earthly, or the, excuse me, the, um, <laughs> Jesus was born of a virgin. He had an earthly mother, but he, he didn't have an earthly father. But the genealogy is there to show that even Joseph came from the lineage. But then in, in Luke, you see another genealogy. And in that genealogy, that's the genealogy of Mary. And you don't see Jehoiakim's name in that one because Jehoiakim was not in that particular lineage. But that comes all the way down to Jesus himself. And so that's just a little sidebar interesting thing in studying this passage. Like, oh, okay, that's interesting. God's curse, what God has said happened, is going to happen. It actually happens. And uh, so we can trust again that he is he is faithful in that. So back to Jeremiah 29 here. Zedekiah is the king. And this letter that Jeremiah is writing is sent to Babylon to be read to the exile. So let's, let's dig into this pen pal letter a little bit and see what Jeremiah writes. Starting in verse 4. Here's what the letter said. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, this, this is the message that Jeremiah is proclaiming. And look who it's to. We see who the recipients of this message is in this portion of Jeremiah 29. It's going to the exiles. And it's coming from God. This is God's message to the exiles. Look at what God says in verse 5. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. God, God is telling the people that they are in Babylon by his will. And we know that. We've been studying Jeremiah for a long time now. And we've been, even the last few chapters, we see that um, Jeremiah proclaimed God's message. It said, surrender to the king when he comes. Don't fight. Surrender and go into exile. Surrender to the, submit to the judgment, the discipline of God, and you'll live. 
And so that's, that's what happened. And so there they are. And now God is telling them, um, don't just survive in Babylon, but seek to thrive while you're in exile. While you're in judgment, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Look what he says in verse 6. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Now, God's not saying take wives from the Babylonians. He's saying take wives from, from God worshipers. The true God worshipers should be the true God worshipers, although many of the Jews were worshiping false gods. God is saying, take, take wives. You're going to be here a long time, but live um, in exile as a follower of Yahweh, as a follower of I am. There is a message here for Christians today. You know, I don't know if you ever think about yourself living in exile, but this world is not our home. We are not, we are citizens maybe nationally, you know, I'm, I'm a citizen of U.S., but my, our greatest citizenship is not from the nation that we live in. It's not from the planet that we live on. We have a citizenship, <laughs> and that's our real citizenship. And, um, you know, if, I, if, you, if you think, I don't know if you think about uh, what, that you're in exile, Scripture calls us aliens, foreigners, strangers, and there's a reason for that it's because this world is not ultimately <clears throat> our home. But I love how this pattern that God gives to the, to the Jewish people in exile in Babylon is, is a, a model for us that we are to see to, to live as followers of Christ, even in a culture that is opposed to Christ. We're not supposed to um, live as the, we're not supposed to adopt the culture as our own values, but we're to engage the culture as we live in the culture and we're to live at peace with one another, one another. And then he even tells us, well, how do we, how do we, what are we to think about the culture that we live in? Look in verse seven. He speaks to the Jewish people here about Babylon, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. I bet you've prayed for <laughs> those in leadership of, of our nation. If not, I want to encourage and, and the world. I want to encourage mm -hmm. you. Oh, that's a biblical thing to do. He says, seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you. They're not to stand in opposition to everything the Babylonians do. Um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't stand for what's right and stand for justice. We should, and we should stand for those um, who are oppressed and those who, um, who are devalued, uh, whether in the womb or outside the womb. We are to, we are to stand and, and for truth and for life. But we also are to seek the welfare of the city uh, where we live or, or the nation where we live. Right here is the city of Babylon. He says, seek the welfare of that city and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. When the city is doing well, you'll do well. When the city is not doing well, you're going to struggle as well. Verse 8 says, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you, don't let them deceive you. Isn't that crazy to think there were people who proclaimed that the Babylonians would never come, that there was going to be peace in the land, and now yet they find themselves in Babylon, those same false prophets, those same diviners who were not from God are still seeking to deceive God's people. That's amazing to me. It seems to me their message should have been easily discredited, and yet we um, sometimes we, we cling to what we're comfortable with instead of bringing this to the Lord and say, Lord, do I really need to cling to this anymore? And Thing that's obvious right here they should have let go and so god's given them a message again don't let them deceive you look what he says and do not listen to the dreams that they dream for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name they're not prophesying to you in my name i did not send them declares the lord <clears throat> declares the lord even even they continue even the false prophets continue to to falsely prophesy i do find this interesting in verse seven that, that Jeremiah says, pray to the Lord um, on its behalf, on Babylon's behalf. I'm, I'm, as I'm sitting here um, walking through this, I'm reminded of, of Paul when he was in prison in Rome and he was writing a letter to the Philippians. Do you remember what he said about the gospel when someone confronted him about the gospel being proclaimed 
Um, and there were some who were doing it with a bad motive. There were some who were proclaiming the gospel to try to get back at Paul or, or for personal, personal gain. And Paul said he, he rejoices that the gospel is being proclaimed. Even though it was with bad motive, the gospel was being proclaimed. He saw the, the bigger picture here and that folks would come to know Christ, even though the one that was preaching was doing it for wrong motives. He was not condoning that motive. But he was saying, praise the Lord that people are coming to Jesus. Well, it's similar to this situation. God is not condoning the actions of the Babylonians. Um, although they are instruments in his hand for his judgment, they also will be held accountable for their actions. But he's telling his people, even as you live in Babylon, pray for the leadership of Babylon. Pray for those um, that make decisions that impact the whole nation and the whole culture because that impacts you. And, and so we have a mandate to pray for those in leadership, whether I agree with that person politically or morally or not, I need to pray that God will bless them with wisdom because the nation will be impacted and lives will be impacted. And so that's a mandate for, for us as well. Um, again, we're not of this world. We're to be in this world, but not of this world is what Jesus prayed for his followers. Um, and, and he tells us to pray for those that are in leadership. Um, let me ask you a question. Just for this, this section right here, if you were going to, going to summarize Jeremiah's message right here to the exiles in one sentence, you were going to write this as a pen pal. Hey, here's what God is saying to the exiles. How would you word this? What would, how would you word this as... Basically, here's what God is saying to you as you live in Babylon as exiles. Here's what God is telling you. That's for out loud. <laughs> what are you gaining from this that God is telling the people and the Jewish people in Babylon? Sometimes you have to just make the best of it when you get in a difficult time. They did. Yeah. That's true. Make the best of it. Could, could the Jewish people change? Could they change the Babylonian culture on their own? No. That's not where they no. Were. no, of course not. You, you, can't, you can't change some. Could they change the Babylonians' hearts? No. You can influence people, but you can't reach and change somebody's hearts. But they can seek to, to benefit the Babylonians by their presence there as well. Um, yeah, that's a great way to do it. Sometimes we we um, to do the best we can in the situation that we're in. There are things, parameters that are on our lives that you and I can't change, aren't there? Your parameters may be different than mine in some ways. Mine may be different than yours. And that may be even physical uh, parameters. There are some things I may deal with in a physical way that you have, the, you have more freedom than I have. But no matter what those parameters are that God has allowed me in my life, I can honor Christ within those parameters. Whether they're this wide or this wide, my life is meant to be the same. That's to glorify God, no matter what the parameters are of my life, if that makes sense. And I'm thankful for that. And right now, the Jewish people, their parameters are about this wide, as they're in Babylon, where they used to be way wide, promising, and yet they rebelled. And so God is bringing judgment, and now they're living in these parameters, and he's saying, live as followers of Christ. Pray for the leader. Houses and wives and family. Honor, honor Christ or honor God, honor Yahweh while you're there. And seek the welfare of those around you. And pray for his behalf. He also gives a message of uh, a future hope. And y'all, this is, to me, we're entering into a section of 100% of um, encouragement here. Even though they're being punished, even though they're in exile, look what he says beginning in verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. He's speaking of Jerusalem and Judah. I will bring you back. And here's the verse that you're probably very familiar with. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. 
I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you, from which I sent you into exile. Sometimes we can endure the most difficult of challenges when we know there is a hope on the other side that we're going to get to. Isn't that true? Sometimes we can do difficult things when we know there's a hope in front of us. Um, I'm going to give you an example. I didn't ask for permission for this. But I'm sorry. I thought I heard somebody say something. Coming up um, in just a couple of weeks, Miss Francis is going to be having a knee replacement. Now, it's not because knee replacements are so much fun. <laughs> Don't kill me. <laughs> you know, they are not. They are not. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> but there is a hope okay. on the other side that there is there's benefit to this. There is a, 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 a healing that would take place, that an ability that would be gained or restored by a knee replacement. Because of that hope, that helps Miss Francis and anybody that's had that procedure choose to go through that difficult time because there's a hope on the other side. Now, the Israelites and the Judahites here, they were they didn't choose to, well, <laughs> they're in exile because they chose to rebel against God. So in a sense, they chose this, but they didn't do it because there was a hope then. They rebelled against hope. But even in the wrath of God, he is saying there's hope on the other side. Here's what's going to happen at the end of 70 years. You can endure because I'm with you and I have a plan for you. It's not that just God was telling the graduates that get ready to graduate. I have a plan for your life. So just seek my plan. And in fact, the ultimate promise of the Lord here isn't even about the plan. The ultimate is about the one who has the plan. <laughs> That's the hope. It's in, it's in God himself. It's in the relationship with God. And um, there's a future deliverance that is coming. And we, we read that clearly in these, these passages. Um, it's, it's the relationship that's, that's the value. Even today, I don't know if someone ever come and ask you, hey, how do I find out God's plan for my life? According to what we see in scripture, the way we find out God's plan for our lives is to pursue Christ, is to pursue Christ today and tomorrow. It doesn't mean I, shan't, I, I can't make plans for the future, but I can tell you, everything that God has for you and me is found in the person of Christ. And so as I pursue Christ, he will lead me. That's what his word says. Um, acknowledge him in all my ways and I will direct your paths, is what he says. He'll, he'll direct our paths in that. Well, the way we acknowledge Jesus, the way we acknowledge God is to worship him and to make him the, the priority of all of our lives, to worship him wholeheartedly. And so I love how God is saying here, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart and in doing so there's a plan I have that will unfold and you will be restored to the land. And I'm so thankful for the hope that we have in Christ. Y'all we're in, we're in um, exile right now. And the reason we can even live in this exile that we're in today. And we've been in since Christ died on the cross and rose again. And now we're his, the body of Christ has been in exile since then. In the sense that we're in the world, but not of the world because our, our citizenship is in him. The reason we can live and thrive today is because of the hope of restoration that he has promised in the tomorrow, whenever tomorrow is. Perhaps it's today. The Lord may come back right now. Um, oh, my goodness. That'd be wonderful. <laughs> oh, Lord. But until that day, we know he's with us and there is a restoration that's coming. Um, and I'm so thankful for that. And that helps us to endure through this day. Um, which I'm, I'm thankful for that promise of his. Um, that helps us actually to focus in the present, doesn't it? We know there's a future that we have. We, we talk about it. The Lord's coming back. The Lord's going to restore all things to himself. We know that's in front of us. But because of that hope, it helps us to focus on the day. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. We can, we can trust the Lord today. And we can endure today because we know that there is a better that's coming. We can live today in light of that day and uh, we can thrive in Christ in that day. So even if today includes suffering, 
which is which is what was going on in the Israelites here. Uh, we know there's a restoration that's coming when rights will be made. Excuse me, wrongs will be made right. You ever get you ever get kind of frustrated sometimes that you can't see the finish line? Mm -hmm. I, just to, I, just, I just want to get there. You know, I know there's a light at the end, of the world, but it sure seems far away. Um, I want to encourage you that God's not limited in what He sees. <laughs> He see he knows the win of the finish line. He knows the win of his return, but he's also with you and with me today, and will be every step of the way until until that return. Ultimately, it's just like um, the blink of an eye. Anyway, it seems like forever sometimes. But if some of y'all just blinked, in fact, when I said that and I saw it, that's our lives, just like that. <laughs> that's the, that's the life here on earth, just like that. But eternity goes on forever. And I'm so thankful that that's the eternity, that's the life that we have um, now and forever. But then there's something that happens here um, that God gives some clarification to the Jewish people here. And let's, so let's continue to read here on what God says in verses 15 through 19. Because you have said the Lord has raised for, up prophets for us in Babylon, thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David. Does anybody know who that king is right now in this time um, that we're reading from? It's the last king, the final four. Starts with a Z. I guess it's Zedekiah. Zedekiah. That's right. That's that Zedekiah. So this is um, says the law concerning the king who sits on the throne of David, Zedekiah, and concerning all the people who dwell in this city, your kinsmen who did not go out with you into exile. So there's still people in Judah, and there's still a king there, and Jeremiah actually is still there. And there was, just to give you the setting, the people that had gone to exile were thinking, well, those people in Judah, they have it better than we do here. And the answer was, God's given us, no, they don't have it better. Look at what he's saying. Um, thus, verse 17, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I am sending on them sword and famine and pestilence. And I will make them like vile figs that are so rotten they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with sword and famine and pestilence and will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse, a terror, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them because they did not pay attention to my words. You remember that Jeremiah had told the people multiple times to go into exile as, a, as, as receive the punishment that God has given to go into exile. They did not listen to my words, verse 19 declares the Lord, that I persistently sent to you by my servants, the prophets, but you would not listen, declares the Lord. Those in captivity were, were discouraged that people were in, still in Judah and were not existing in exile. They Certainly they have, have it better than we do here in exile. And God sent the message, no, they don't. They actually are going to be facing a judgment that is going to be horrible. It's going to be terrible. Um, so they don't. So he's bringing clarification there. That helps us to know, even, you know, sometimes we can look around and we think, God, people that are disobeying you, they seem to have it better than we do when we're seeking to obey you. And if you get discouraged by that, Jeremiah did earlier in Jeremiah 12. He's like, why do the wicked prosper? Everywhere I look, the people that are rejecting you are prospering. And God tells Jeremiah, <laughs> Jeremiah, you're getting worn out by comparing yourself to others. If, if you're getting worn out now, you just wait. It's going to get harder, is what he says. If you're getting tired running with the footmen, you wait till the horsemen come, is what he says in Jeremiah 12. And, and that's what he's saying here. Don't those who disobey God, that things may seem better in the moment, but they're actually they're facing a looming judgment that is far worse. And that's true for us when we disobey God as well. We never benefit from disobedience. That's the lie of sin. It's the lie of sin. Sin can tell you, oh, this is a shortcut to uh, what God really wants for my life. Here's a little shortcut. I can do this on my own. I can help God out. I can do this, and I really don't care what God says. I'm going to go this direction. But sin leads to death. Don't fall for the lie that it will be better. There will be a better outcome if you, it, when it involves disobedience to God. I'm a terrible underestimator of the depravity of my own soul, of my own heart. <laughs> My heart is depraved, and I'm terrible because I underestimate how deep my sin is. But I, and I'm also a terrible, terrible overestimator of, um, of of my own righteousness. And I say that because I'm saying that as, in the sense of the human heart, mine and yours. Uh, we tend to 
underestimate our depravity and overestimate our righteousness. Truth is, our righteousness is like filthy rags. <laughs> and we all deserve, what we deserve is the wrath of God. But there's no way to overestimate the value of God's grace. There's no way to overestimate that. Because his grace is so great, it's greater than all our sin put together. All of it. And so don't ever fall for the lie that disobedience is better than obedience. Um, we, we can surrender to the Lord and follow him, even if it leads us to horrible, difficult times. Jeremiah lived this out over and over. And there he, we saw he, he struggled internally with this sometimes. And yet God restored him and brought him back and said, Jeremiah, have faith in me. And he did. And, um, and we see the Lord saying, reassuring the people, no, there's not for those who are being disobedient. It gets a little personal here, Jeremiah does, or God does in this message. Let's continue reading in verse 20. Hear the word of the Lord, all you exiles who I sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning, and he starts, he names names right here, two prophets here, two false prophets. And he says, um, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Kaliah, and Zedekiah, the son of Messiah. So Ahab and Zedekiah are the two false prophets that he's speaking of. And he says, who are prophesying a lie to you in my name. Remember how we said God does not take false prophecy lightly? That's always a serious thing. Always a serious thing. Look what he says. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of the king of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And he shall strike them down before your eyes. Imagine being in the hearing of this letter that's being read in Babylon, you know, this message from Jeremiah, and imagine if you were Ahab or Zedekiah, a false prophet, this message comes out. Ahab and Zedekiah will be struck down by Nebuchadnezzar before the eyes of the exiles. <coughs> Verse 22 says, because of them, it's going to be so terrible, because of them, this curse shall be used by all the exiles from Judah and Babylon. The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. It was going to be so terrible for those false prophets that even what would happen to them would be words used to, to, as a as a curse to others. In the sense that, you know, I want things to be, you, you to face the judgment of God so much, I hope it's like Ahab and Zedekiah. That kind of a curse that, that, that Judahites may speak to someone else. It was that terrible. Because, why? Verse 23, because they have done an outrageous thing in Israel. They have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives, and they have spoken in my name, lying words that I did not command them. God says, I am the one who knows, and I am the witness, declares the Lord. There is a, there is a question here, so do they commit literal adultery, or do they commit spiritual adultery, which is an analogy that Jeremiah used, and God uses over and over through Scripture, that when we are disobedient to God, it's, it's an adulterous, spiritually adulterous affair, um, since we are supposed to belong to the Lord and be his, and we are uh, being unfaithful with our sin, whatever that sin is. This is they literally uh, committed adultery, or they may have uh, spiritually committed adultery. In any case, nothing they did was in secret. God says right here, I'm the one who knows. I'm the witness, declares the Lord. Um, I don't know if you find the fact that God sees everything that you and I do assuring or alarming. <laughs> But ultimately, it is assuring because there's no secret that I have from God, and he loves me anyway. And yet, there is a wrath that's involved because of my sin, and Jesus paid that wrath. And there's also a discipline that comes. And God loves us enough to discipline us when we sin. So really, it's reassuring that God sees everything. And that's what he's saying here to Ahab and Zedekiah. There's a judgment that's coming because I see everything. Um, and you are you are leading my people. It was going to be a terrible judgment, so that the proverb would go out: "The Lord make you like Zechariah and Ahab, who were roasted in the fire by Nebuchadnezzar." We are at our. Let me ask you: Is there anything you want to add or say here before I move to the very final portion here? Let's look at this final portion because there's another false prophet, and this one's in. It's like crabgrass. They just can't seem, seem to pop up everywhere. And this is one in Babylon. Shemaiah is his name. And um, Shemaiah, he sought to do something <laughs> to Je Jeremiah, who's back in Judah, who's back in Jerusalem. Shemaiah wanted Jeremiah to be quiet. Here's these messages coming. 
from the Lord and God and Jeremiah's telling us, oh, take wives and build houses and, you know, have children. You're going to be here a long time. And so there's a false message that said, no, 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 we're not going to be here long. God's going to free us and we're going to be back in Judah. We're not suffering his punishment here. Um, this is a speed bump. That's all this is. And so Shemaiah did something that still happens today. He starts politicking. He starts campaigning and seeking to use his influence to get Jeremiah to be quiet. And so look what he, let's read that. Look what he does here. He reveals, um, God reveals through Jeremiah that it's not going to end well for Shemaiah. Verse 24. Remember, this is a false prophet in Babylon right now. It's a Jewish false prophet in Babylon. And Jeremiah is writing this message. To Shemaiah of Nehalam, you shall, you shall say, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, you have sent letters in your name to all the people who are in Jerusalem. And to Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, um, Messiah the priest. Let me stop there because there's a lot of names here in a short amount of time. Um, Shemaiah has sent letters to Ze um, Zephaniah. Zephaniah was a priest in Jerusalem. And so Shemaiah thought, you know what? I'm not in Jerusalem. I can't really make Jeremiah be quiet, but I know, some, I know somebody who can. And that's a priest in Jerusalem. I'm going to send a letter to him. That'll be to all the people. I'm a campaign against Jeremiah. All the way from Babylon, I'm a campaign against Jeremiah that the priest there will make Jeremiah quiet. That's what my goal is. And so that's what he's doing here. And, and God knows it. And so God said through Jeremiah, I know what you're doing. And um, so he sent these letters to Zephaniah and to all the priests there saying, verse 26, the Lord has made you priest instead of Jehoiada the priest to have change in the house of the Lord over every madman who prophesies. That's what he's calling Jeremiah, a madman. Um, and to put him in the stocks and neck irons. And Shemaiah continues in this letter. He says, so now why have you not rebuked Jeremiah of Anathoth, who is prophesying to you? For he has sent us to us in Babylon saying, your exile will be long, build houses and live in them and plant gardens and eat their produce. Shemaiah is out here in Babylon. He's seeking to use his influence because of somebody that he knows to stop Jeremiah from proclaiming this message. Have you ever heard the saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know? Sometimes we do that when, you know, sometimes we see people get jobs um, because it's not really what they know, but they happen to know somebody in and they were able to get a job or we see it in politics all the time. Um, the way to get change or a way to get power sometimes is not what you know, but it's who you know. Um, actually, you know, there's there's a part of me that wants to push back against that. But in reality, that's the way we're saved <laughs> as well. It's not what you know, it's who you know. I can know all about Jesus, but if I don't know him, it's not going to do me a bit of good for salvation. Salvation comes through knowing Christ alone. It's through faith in Christ alone. It doesn't, I'm not saying that justifies, you know, that, that kind of um, influence in the world that the most qualified person may not get a job because a, a lesser qualified person happened to know somebody in the circle, right? Um, good old boy, colony system, I am so opposed to that stuff. I just think the best person ought to get the job. And um, I think politics ought to be, I wish there was not so much lobbying going on that money makes things happen. Dead gummit. But in this situation, we see Shemaiah seeking to do that. He's seeking to have Jeremiah be quiet because he knows the priest in Jerusalem. So he sends this letter saying, you're the priest for a reason. Um, you know, God put you there. He's actually invoking the name of God. God put you there to bring change. And now you got this prophet running around like a madman. He's proclaiming that to the people here. He's writing letters to here in Babylon saying, take wives, take, you know, build houses. You should do something about it. Even makes a suggestion here, you know, put him in the stocks, put him in the neck iron. Oh, make sure that he can't write letters anymore. But once again, there's a great takeaway take right here. Once again, we see God do something. We've seen him do all through the yeah, book of Jeremiah. He fights Jeremiah's battles. God fights Jeremiah's battles. <laughs> he fights yours and mine too. Look what he says here in verse 29. And this letter came. Zephaniah the priest read this letter in the hearing of Jeremiah the prophet. And then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Send to all the exiles. Send another letter back to the exiles. And, and thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah, Nehalam. So there's a letter coming back to Babylon. 
And here's what it says. Because Shemaiah had prophesied to you when I did not send him, says the Lord, and he has made you trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will punish Shemaiah of Nehalam and his descendants. He shall not have anyone living among this people. And he shall not see the good that I will do to my people, declares the Lord, for he has spoken rebellion against the Lord. Jemiah had not heard from the Lord, although he claimed he had. He, he was seeking to manipulate um, Jer Jeremiah's silence, and that was not from the Lord. And so God fought Jeremiah's battles here and gave Jeremiah a message to send back that, that Shemaiah would be cursed. He would experience the wrath of God in such a way that he, when the time of exile ended and, and the people of Judah, all the restoration of God back in the land, there would be nobody in Shemaiah's lineage who would experience it. He may have descendants there, but none of them would live long enough to come back into, into Judah. And it would come to pass. God's, God's promise, what we've seen this over and over, and it's reassuring for us today, we can know that that's, that's what's going to happen because God spoke that, and that's what would happen. They would, they would die out in Babylon. It's interesting that Shemaiah's actions bore fruit in the lives of his family that followed him. And so there's another takeaway here for, for me that I want to encourage you with this. Um, your faithfulness to the Lord brings fruit that you'll never see on this side of heaven. But you can trust that God brings fruit through your faithfulness. He does. It may be to your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. It may be to people outside your family, but your faithfulness, God will use to bear fruit in ways, even in your lifetime, even in your neighbors and your friends right now, God will use your faithfulness to bear fruit, spiritual fruit in their lives. Some of it is really slow growing. <laughs> you may be seeking to, to invest in someone's life by speaking truth into their life to come alongside them in a hard time. Maybe they're rebelling against the Lord and you, the Lord on your heart to pray for them and to share a word with them and they may reject your word and you're thinking well gosh that just feels like it was wasted i want to tell you based on what god's word says that his word doesn't return void and the outcome may not be seen in your eyes or mine but god works in hearts and sometimes it's a slow growing fruit but we know it's fruit in the same way your unfaithfulness and my unfaithfulness also impacts the lives far beyond what our eyes can see as well. There may be things I think is not a big deal. I'll just rebel against the Lord in this little way. And there will be those around me who are robbed of the opportunity to have fruit in their lives that we, we could have been there. Or there are those that may be influenced to follow my lead in that and to minimize the things of the Lord. And that's because of my actions. And so there's a great accountability in our lives. That's why the Lord says every thought will be taken captive. You know, we can take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, but we'll be held accountable. The things even we do in secret will be shot from the rooftops. There's an accountability coming. That's not meant to terrify us as much as it is to motivate us. Like we need any more motivation to honor the Lord other than he's such a great God <laughs> and his glory is above all. But even that truth, if you need one more motivation to know and love the Lord and live for him faithfully, let it be that God will bring fruit from your faithfulness greater than what your eyes can see. There's people that you invested in your life that don't even know it, aren't there? There's people that had a spiritual influence on you that you may not have been aware of that great influence until after they even died. And yet they didn't see the fruit, but God brought fruit in your life. My granddad was one of my life. He pointed me to Christ and he died when I was 16 and I didn't know Jesus then. And it was after that that I came to know Christ. And I realized how much God had used my granddad in my own life to point me to Jesus. He never saw the fruit. But I'm thankful that he invested. And I'm thankful that our faithfulness to God, we know that he brings bring fruit. So that's another takeaway I want to encourage you with today. And all the judgment that we've seen in Jeremiah, isn't it such a blessing to see the hope and the mercy that he promises his people? He will bring restoration. When you say... I sure do wish the Lord would come. Just know the Lord is going to come back and there's a restoration that's coming because he has made that promise to us. This isn't our home. This isn't our, our world. Our world is not our home. We are aliens here. 
so on. We can live in a way that those that are of the earth don't even understand the joy and the peace that we have and are drawn to Christ in our lives. So I want to encourage you, love on someone today, pray for them, and, um, and point them to Christ through your, through your actions today. Whether or not the Lord lets you see the fruit, just know he's the one that brings the fruit. And he is the source of hope for all of us. Do you have any uh, any thoughts or questions or anything about Jeremiah 29 here? Ron, I wanted to say one thing uh, that I meant to say earlier. Alfred Ward called uh, on the telephone and spoke to Valerie and Al Hick, Valerie Hicks. Yeah. Uh, I got a message over the weekend and he took some steps last week, and it was the first steps he had taken since the first part of January. Oh, my gracious. What a blessing. What a praise. Mm -hmm. That is a praise. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Well, I know I know Heather was elated, <laughs> and Alfred too, um, but I know Heather must be elated as well. Thank you, Susan. Y'all, let me close us in prayer, and we'll be, um, we'll be done with our time together today. Let me pray for us. Father, I do thank you that you are such a good father, such a great father to us. And thank you for your love that's unconditional for us. Because if it was not for your love and mercy, we'd have no hope. Thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for us. And Lord, I pray that you help us to live as your children, citizens of the kingdom of God, even in this land that we're in today. And um, I pray that we would allow to be different because of Christ living in our lives. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you Thank guys. You, Have a great week. Thank Have you. a great weekend. Thank and we'll you. see you soon. Love you in the Lord. Love you. Thank you. Take care.